Welcome everybody. I'm Jessica Hamlin, Executive Director at Shimla Archaeological Center. So happy to have you today for our August 2024 um, Lunch and Learn. Today you'll be hearing from Shimla Curator and Data Manager Kelsey Hart, and I am going to turn it right over to her to tell us about one step at a time, building our capacity for digital preservation. Kelsey, thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so, uh, so as Jessica said, my job is the curator and data manager at Shumla. I'm a little newer. If you haven't seen me before, I started back in January. And my job is to take care of Shumla's uh, collections, both physical and digital. Um, and in this Lunch and Learn, we'll be talking specifically about our digital preservation efforts. So thanks for joining me. Um, we're going to start off today by just defining some key terms. So what do I actually mean by curation? So curation is the long-term care and management of collections, um, usually for the purposes of exhibits, research, education, or just general access for um, the general public. Sorry, I'm having, I need to adjust something here. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so um, curation has a special meaning in archaeology um, because it's the final step in the research process. So after um, you do your research design, usually an archaeologist will go out into the field and collect their data. Um, they'll have to go back to the lab and do a little bit of additional analysis. Um, and then they write a big publication or report about their work. And so curation happens after that final step. So after everything's art been all wrapped up, the archeologist will deposit um, those artifacts and records at a uh, qualified museum or repository for long-term preservation. So what do I mean by digital curation? So similar to the care of physical artifacts and records, digital curation is the active care and management of digital objects throughout their life cycle. And so a digital object can be any computerized file or system that you wish to preserve. So I'll also kind of be using the terms data or digital data interchangeably throughout this presentation, but um, it means the same thing as a digital object. So digital objects can actually lead quite complex lives. So this is a diagram of the digital curation life cycle. I know there's a lot going on here. There will not be a quiz at the end of this. Um, but you can see that digital files are created, they're selected, stored, accessed and used, and sometimes even discarded. So digital curation is the management of these files through all of these different processes. Now you may notice that um, a portion of the digital preservation life cycle is, or digital curation life cycle, excuse me, has to do with preservation and preservation actions. So just kind of put a pin in that and remember that we will come back to that in a little bit. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about digital objects. So there are two major types. Um, there's files that have been digitized from a physical format. So for example, when you scan paper documents or photographs to make a digital version. And then there are files that are so-called born digital. And this means that they were originally created in a digital format and they've always existed as a digital object. So there's no physical surrogate. So examples of born digital objects could include things like uh, text files, image files, spreadsheets, software programs, and even whole websites. So these are all digital objects that could be digitally preserved. An important thing to note about these born digital objects is that they can only really be truly preserved in a digital format. So there's no physical format or paper-based format that could fully replicate all of that rich information and functionality that the digital file has. So for example, um, this is a screenshot of um, a 3D model of a rock art site. Um, this is something we routinely create as part of our baseline documentation. And these files were originally 
um, created as, as a digital file. They're always meant to be interacted with in a digital environment. This is just a screenshot, but um, if you go to uh, you know, our website, you can actually move these around and interact with them. Um, and there's really no way to reproduce those same features in a physical model. So that's why we need a digital preservation solution for these born digital objects. So digital objects have some specific features that make them really useful to us, but also make them highly vulnerable to loss over time. So the first major vulnerability is their dependence on technology. They can only be accessed and interacted with using a computer. And they also, in general, have to be interacted with in a compatible hardware and software environment. So all of the systems that you're using need to be able to talk to each other in order to access that digital file. Uh, the other major vulnerability is that digital objects actually have really short lifespans. You might be surprised to hear that it's generally considered to be less than 10 years if no preservation actions are undertaken. So to put that into perspective, we have paper records from uh, you know, hundreds of years ago that have um, a proven lifespan of that period given the right storage conditions. So you can see that digital preservation is a major obstacle for organizations that need that long-term preservation. Uh, one of the uh, reasons why this lifespan is so short is the physical condition of the storage medium. So all of these digital files, even if they're so-called in the cloud, they are stored on physical hard drives or servers somewhere. And this is an image of what a hard uh, type of hard drive looks like. Um, and these hard drives, since they're physical objects, they're vulnerable to a variety of problems um, and they need to be actively monitored and replaced relatively frequently to ensure the integrity of those files. Another major threat is technological obsolescence. So as technology progresses and you know there's new software systems or, that get updated, um, it becomes more and more likely that older file formats are going to be no longer supported by the current technologies. So this can make a digital object inaccessible or unusable, even if you have it securely saved. And finally, another major threat to digital objects is that they are easily altered and easily deleted which is also one of their major advantages. That's one of the reasons we like to do things in a digital environment is you can, you know, the files are dynamic and you can easily update them when you have new information. Um, however, that makes them vulnerable to harmful alterations or unintended alterations, um, either accidentally through human error, like accidentally deleting a file um, or deliberately through something like a hack or a virus. So the big question becomes, how do we preserve these digital objects for the long term, given these threats and vulnerabilities? So this is where digital preservation comes in. So digital preservation is defined as the set of managed activities needed to ensure continued access to those digital objects over time. And there's a few key points to this definition that I'm going to highlight. So the first is, um, like we were talking about before, digital preservation is just one part of that digital curation life cycle we saw earlier. So you can think of it as a subset of all of those um, digital curation activities that happen over the life cycle. So digital preservation is one of those activities. Um, the second point is that the goal of digital preservation is to preserve the information that that digital object contains. So in most cases, it's not necessary to actually preserve the digital object or, um, in its original format and storage medium. So in fact, kind of one of the major strategies is to continually update the format of the digital object to match the new technologies. And that is what ensures that the information is still accessible. So an example of this, um, if you remember these programs from the past, 
would be converting a WordPerfect or a WordStar file, which is an older word processing program. Maybe it was saved on a floppy disk. Um, and if you convert it to a modern Microsoft Word file, such as a doc, .docx file or a PDF, um, that means that it can now be accessed using you know, your regular modern computer and operating system. So that's a very common digital preservation strategy to make sure that that information is still accessible. So we don't really care that it was originally word perfect. We just wanna make sure that you can still read it. Um, and it's okay if that process doesn't quite click yet, we're gonna come back to it when we talk more about the fine points of digital preservation. Uh, but this process is called migration when you update the file format. Another key point of this definition is accessibility. So in this context, accessibility means that somebody in the future can find this information to be readable and usable. So this has a lot to do with the content of the information that is contained in the digital object. So the quality of that information, how it's described, um, and again, it's understandability to future users. And we're thinking of people like 10, 20, you know, maybe 50 years from now. So people far into the future. Um, and a good example of this is that there's usually not much value in preserving scientific data by itself. For example, like a test result or a spreadsheet if you don't also preserve information about how that data was collected, recorded and interpreted. So you really need both pieces of information preserved together. And finally, digital preservation is for the long-term. So this means greater than about 10 years and ideally a lot longer. So for Shumla, we wanna preserve our data in perpetuity or as long as possible for the public benefit. So the goal is that through appropriate digital preservation actions, these digital objects will be able to outlast those limitations that we talked about before. So the limitations of the storage media and technology changes, as well as organizational changes. So you also need a plan for what happens to all of your digital data if your organization's no longer able to care for them one day. So there's really a lot that goes into thinking about digital preservation. Okay, so that was a lot. <laughs> so Jessica had a great suggestion for this presentation to intersperse in um, some little uh, breaks here. So we're just gonna um, pop uh, you know, an image on the screen, we're gonna call this a rock art break, even though there's no rock art in this photo, um, to let some of that information sink in for you. And also um, just to highlight some photos that you may not have seen before um, from things that have happened in the last year. So um, this photo is from recent field work this summer and you can see our archeologist David here just looking happy as a clam. <laughs> so they actually had to take a boat this summer. I, I wasn't there, but our, our other uh, archeologists were um, to access some of the sites. And this is Jack Johnson from the National Park Service and he was kind enough to, to drive the boat for us. Uh, I also need to adjust something here real quick. Okay, great. Okay, so now that you all are experts in digital preservation, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about why digital preservation is so important for Shimla before we go into all of those details of what digital preservation actually looks like in practice. So the simple answer to that question is that preservation is at the foundation of Shuma's mission. So our mission is to preserve the oldest books in North America, which is the rock art of the Lower Pecos Canyonlands through the four pillars of documentation, research, stewardship, and education. And so digital preservation um, of our rock art documentation, our research data, and all of our images that we take um, directly supports each of these pillars and our overall mission. So this is really foundational to everything else that we're doing. 
Curations also are ethical responsibility as archaeologists. So curation is required in the code of ethics for most major archaeology professional organizations, including the ones I have listed on the slide. Um, and the reason why curation is so important in archaeology is because archaeological sites are vulnerable um, to damage and deterioration over time, including from the archaeological excavations themselves. So the curated artifacts and records are oftentimes the only information about that site that may be available to future generations after that project is complete. So the rock art sites that Shima studies are no exception to this. So rock art sites have um, many uh, threats to their preservation. Um, so those can include natural factors um, and also human activities. So things like vandalism or looting. Um, oftentimes there's significant barriers to getting to these sites, um, such as uh, difficult or remote locations. A lot of them are really like high up on cliff faces. Um, and there's also seasonal flooding um, that can impact uh, a lot of these different sites. And in addition, a lot of these sites are on private land. So um, here at Shumla, we really value our relationships with the landowners um, because they're really important stewards of these murals. So for various reasons, sometimes we only have one opportunity to visit a site and document it. And once a rock art site becomes damaged, destroyed, or otherwise inaccessible, um, the documentation and images that we collect, um, such as this um, panel map that you see here on the slide, um, this may become the only source of information about that site that's available for the future. So these records are really important, and in most cases, they can't be reproduced. Another reason why digital preservation is so important to Shumla is that, um, like other archaeologists, it's the final step in our research process. So we want to make our findings available um, for the public, for other researchers and educators, for landowners, and for also um, Indigenous communities. So uh, preservation and data sharing or publication of our findings is a key component of our research design. So um, it kind of closes the loop on that digital curation life cycle and also that research process. So if you've been following Shimla, um, you'll be familiar with these two projects that I'm about to talk about, but I'll give you a quick refresher. So the Alexandria project was a massive project undertaken by Shimla from 2017 to 2020. And this was to complete uh, documentation of as many rock art sites as possible. Uh, recognizing that a lot of these sites are threatened and need to be documented before it's too late. So Shumla's baseline documentation method involves the creation of a variety of digital objects for each site. So this includes uh, PDF and Word documents, Excel and access databases, uh, geospatial or GIS data, uh, 3D models, giga panoramic images, Adobe Photoshop files, and many hundreds or thousands of photographs, which are saved in both compressed and uncompressed formats. So in total, 236 sites were documented during the Alexandria project, and this resulted in nearly 25 terabytes of data, which is a lot. So due to the large size of this data set and its tremendous value, um, the Alexandria Project Archive is really kind of the primary focus of these digital preservation efforts because we want to make sure that this is preserved for the future. Um, our latest work has been under the umbrella of the Hearthstone Project, and this project involved a much deeper analysis of a smaller selection of sites through uh, stratigraphy, radiocarbon dating, and indigenous consultation. Um, and if you're a regular at these lunch and learns, you know all about that, that project because we just completed a good series of presentations. So you can go to um, our website or YouTube page to learn more about this project. But this project also produced a variety of new digital objects. So in addition to some of the file types we saw with the Alexandria project, we also have some newer formats. Um, that are unique to this project, such as Harris Matrix composer files, um, full panel renderings or illustrations, 
um, of the rock art at these sites, uh, audio recordings and transcripts um, from the indigenous consultation and digital microscopy images. So overall, this project produced a, um, a much smaller amount of data because we're going to fewer sites, um, but it will still be an important part of our digital preservation efforts, um, as well as any future projects we do. Um, so it'll all um, be part of this digital preservation initiative. And finally, the last uh, major reason why digital preservation is important to Shuma's mission is that um, our digital data is vulnerable for those same reasons that we talked about for all digital objects. Um, but for us, this issue is particularly urgent because virtually all of our data is in that or digital category. So it has to be preserved in a digital format. Um, and the sheer size of our data makes any digital preservation program um, more difficult and more costly to implement. Um, but it's important to note that we're not alone in this issue. So digital preservation is a, a pressing issue for archeology span in general, uh, because archeologists are increasingly using digital methods to document sites such as laser scanning or 3D models that we do. Um, and in the field, many archaeologists now only use digital forms on a tablet, so they actually don't create any paper records anymore. Um, but unfortunately, most museums and archaeological repositories um, that curate these records don't have the technology or staff expertise to actually do digital preservation. So they mostly specialize in physical artifacts and paper records. So there's kind of a, a mismatch there um, as this technology is progressing. Um, and this issue goes beyond just archeology span in the United States. So UNESCO has identified the loss of digital heritage information um, around the world as an issue of worldwide concern. So they've um, put out several reports about this topic. Um, and some people even think we're on the brink of a so-called uh, digital dark age due to the loss of all of this, potential loss of all of this important data around the world that's not being appropriately preserved. So for Shuma, I'd like to emphasize that our data is secure um, for now, but these issues will become more and more pressing as time goes on and technology changes. So we're really thinking ahead and trying to be proactive about this issue for our organization and for our data. Okay, we're taking another break. <laughs> So this is a nice image from um, a Shuma trek I got to go on uh, last spring to Painted Shelter. So um, it is a little hard to tell from this photo, but there is a little bit of rock art um, on the panel here. And there's a lot more behind me. Um, if you've been to this site, you, um, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but I took this image just because uh, it really captures uh, how beautiful the landscape is down there and at this particular site. Um, we were actually there at uh, kind of the perfect time of day, so the, the sunlight was reflecting off the water and onto the rock art panel, and it was actually almost like animating the art and bringing it to life, so um, it was a really uh, kind of magical experience, so it's one of my uh, favorite things I've gotten to do with Shuma so far. So. Okay, so you guys understand hopefully now why digital preservation is important and you kind of have the basic um, definition of it. And now we're gonna dive in to a little bit more of those details of what these preservation actions actually look like. So digital preservation is not a one-time activity. So it's actually a series of activities that operate kind of at multiple levels throughout that uh, digital objects life cycle. So the first aspect of digital preservation we're gonna talk about is bit preservation. Um, and this is probably what most of you are thinking of when preserving a digital file. So this means that the, the bits or the binary digits, which are the ones and zeros that make up that digital object are saved without loss or damage. And there's a few strategies to ensure bit preservation. 
So we talked about how it's important to monitor and replace that storage hardware. Um, it's also important to back up your data. So to have multiple copies in different storage locations and just to have adequate IT kind of security procedures in general to ensure the security of those files. Another level of digital preservation that we've touched on is format preservation. So this means that the format of your digital object or the, the file type, so you know, is it a PDF, is it a Word document, etc., cetera, um, and the software needed to open that specific file type, um, you wanna make sure that both of those are available and supported by the, you know, the current technologies that you're using. So um, we already talked about that migration process. So that's the example I gave of, you know, maybe converting an old WordPerfect file to a modern day PDF. That's an example of migrating the file format to something that a modern computer can open and you as a human can read the information that's contained in that Word document. Um, another word for that uh, is normalization. So you might see that sometimes as well. Um, emulation is another strategy to deal with file formats that are outdated and are no longer supported. Um, it's somewhat less common than migration, um, but emulation is when you actually try to recreate that original software and hardware environment in which the file was created. So you're trying to use, you know, maybe an old operating system that no longer is in use anymore so that you can open the file. So oftentimes it's kind of the first step in migration if you have a really old file that you need to you know, access the original file in a compatible environment before you convert it over to something modern. Um, so it's more, necess more commonly necessary for very old files um, which aren't compatible with any current systems. And when we're talking about digital files, uh, just to put a perspective, sadly, when I say very old, I mean things from the mid to late 1990s um, are typically not accessible today. So uh, that's, that's a bit sobering if you think about it. Um, whereas, like I said, we still have paper records from decades ago that are perfectly readable today. So these, you could really see how these digital objects do have a much shorter lifespan. So next we're gonna talk about something um, that you can call intellectual preservation. That's one way of thinking about it. And this is addressing the integrity and authenticity of the content, the intellectual content of the digital objects. So this is basically making sure that the information encoded in the file is preserved as originally intended and has not been changed. So one strategy to address data integrity is to use something called a checksum or a fixity check. So a checksum is a small block of data that you can attach to each file and it serves as kind of a digital finger fingerprint so it's unique to that file. And then you can run a software process called a fixity check which verifies um, those checksum values against uh, a known log, and it verifies that they haven't been changed. So if you change the file, the checksum value changes. Uh, and this is just an illustration of kind of how that works. So if you were to actually examine um, these two lines of code here, you'll see that they actually don't match. So if you see this kind of result in your fixed U check, then you know that some kind of alteration has happened to the file. Another strategy um, for data integrity is to use audit trails. Um, so these are sometimes embedded in certain software programs. And these give you a log of all of the alterations that have been made to the file. So um, these two strategies, checksums and audit trails, um, they don't actually prevent the unauthorized alterations or unintended alterations, but they can help you identify and mitigate them after they've already occurred. Another way that digital curators support data authenticity is through something called metadata. So metadata literally means 
data about data. Um, and it's kind of like the artifact tag or catalog card that tells you all of the essential information about a digital object. And it's encoded in the digital package itself commonly. So um, for example, if you right click on a digital photo, say to your computer, um, you can see metadata that was automatically encoded by the camera. So this could be like the date and time the photo was taken or some of the camera settings, you know, the resolution of the photo, things of that nature. Um, so that's an example of metadata that you've probably used or accessed before. So metadata is really important and really useful in digital preservation. Um, it can be entered manually um, or it can be automatically assigned by a software program. Um, in terms of best practices, there are um, a variety of uh, metadata schemes or standards that you can use to, um, to standardize your data entry and formatting and make sure it's readable by other software systems. So if someone else can open that file or open that metadata and see everything as you originally recorded it. Um, so provenance metadata is one type of metadata that's required for digital preservation. Um, and it describes the source or origin of a digital object, um, its chain of custody and its processing history. So again, this can help you kind of document that um, that digital object is the original one that you intended to preserve and it hasn't been changed um, since you've had custody of it. Okay, I hope you're still with me. <laughs> Next, we're gonna talk about contextual preservation. So I alluded to this earlier. This means that in addition to preserving the digital object itself, and you know the information that is contained in it. Um, you also want to preserve all of the contextual information that makes that um, that content meaningful and usable for future users. So, someone who maybe um, who didn't participate in the data collection, who's maybe not affiliated with your organization at all. So, think about just you know a member of the general public accessing. Um, data or a photo or a file or something, you know, maybe 20 years from now, you want to make sure they have all the information that they need to understand what that digital object means and why it's important. So this could, um, a really simple example of this would be preserving the photo log along with a digital photo. So the photo itself can tell you some information, but that photo log is really going to give you all of that context that you need to really um, understand it completely. And ideally, this would also be accompanied by the report of um, how that data was collected during that particular field session. So um, in addition uh, to you know, preserving this contextual information, um, there's also metadata that can be added. Um, that's called context metadata. And this can be used to specify um, how and why the digital object was produced and how it's related to other digital objects. So maybe this photo was collected as part of the Alexandria project and it's related to all of the other digital photos that were collected at that same site on that same day. So that's an example of context metadata. Contextual preservation um, because uh, of the the, um, the need to, to really preserve the whole environment around that digital object. It does require um, quite a bit of coordination, ideally, between the people who produce the data. So in our case, maybe the archeologist who's actually in the field taking the photo and the people curating the data like myself, um, or maybe an external archive that you're submitting this information to. And ideally this should happen at the very beginning of the curation life cycle. So, um, you know, ideally before you even collect the data, you're already thinking about how it's going to be preserved. Um, it's really crucial that adequate documentation about the digital object is produced. So about that project that resulted in the digital object. Um, and it's important that those records are selected for long-term preservation. So you really want the whole package altogether. 
And then finally, <laughs> I promise this is the last one, uh, we also have to consider um, access and reuse. So how are these digital objects being used by people in the future? Um, and oftentimes this is facilitated by adding um, even more metadata. So like I said, metadata is very important. So um, one type of metadata that is essential for access and reuse is um, descriptive information. So users need to be able to uh, search for digital objects. So um, this could be in a digital database or archive. So descriptive information is where you assign attributes to the digital object that you want to appear in searches. So these are kind of like your keywords um, and they uh, enable the digital object to be found when somebody searches for them. Users also need to understand the terms under which they are allowed to use the digital object. So access rights metadata is where you can outline um, any special conditions for access or use. So this could include things like um, intellectual property information, which would be like uh, copyright information or maybe uh, licensing information for digital photos. Um, for archaeological data, this is really important because uh, there are typically access restrictions regarding any references to archaeological site locations, um, which are withheld from the general public to protect sites from things like looting and vandalism or just unauthorized visitation. So um, in addition to those kinds of restrictions, um, you may have some special conditions um, for access and use that are requested by the landowner or by indigenous groups who are both um, important stewards of the rock art. So respecting those special conditions um, is considered to be, uh, is part of the code of ethics for ARARA, which is the American Rock Art Research Association. So it is part of our ethical responsibility. We happily honored those requests about how um, images should be shared. And we're a very active member of ARARA, so we, uh, we hold those ethics as part of our own principles as well. And access rights metadata is one way to honor that code of ethics when you pair um, that information with software that can authenticate and control user access. And we're making sure that only people who are authorized to view something are given access to view it. And finally, users need to be able to create a stable reference to the digital object. So for example, if you're using an image in a publication or presentation, you wanna be able to kind of authoritatively link to that source image. Um, so reference metadata assigns a unique identifier to each digital object so that it can be tracked and referred to in that way. Um, this is commonly in the form of something called a DOI, which is a digital object identifier. And it functions kind of like a unique uh, URL for the digital object. And you can use it uh, like a citation or a URL um, that we, you would use in general. Okay, so now we can zoom out and really see the big picture of digital preservation, which is that it is an interrelated balance between these three types of activities. So it's a balance between um, technology, management, and content related activities. So it's really important for the organization to regularly engage in digital preservation planning to stay current on those changing technologies and standards. Um, to identify and manage any risks to the preservation of your data, um, to improve your IT systems, um, to grow your staff expertise, and to get to know your community of potential users of your data. So a big takeaway here is that digital preservation is a multidisciplinary team effort, and it requires contributions from subject matter um, experts, IT and computer science folks, curation and preservation folks, and your organizational leadership. So it's not something that, you know, any one person can really just do single-handedly.
So um, just to give you kind of an idea of where we're at in this process, um, to date, our digital preservation efforts have focused on bit preservation so that secure storage and backup of our files, which is really the foundation of any digital preservation program. That's where you have to start. And that's really essential to all of the other activities that you need to do. So we have two sets of servers. One is in our Comstock office and one is in our San Marcos office. And these servers are mirrored copies of one another. So both servers are backed up offline weekly or at least every other week. And this setup gives geographic distribution to the storage of our working files and our backups. And so in total, um, our data size, total data size, including the backups, is about 80 terabytes. So it's really a lot of data that we are managing. And I have to give a shout out to Mario Gonzalez here. So he is our uh, wonderful fractional chief technology officer. And he has designed and maintained this whole system for us. And there's a lot more to it that we don't have time to cover. And so he's really proactive about potential threats and he's always working on improvements. Um, he's also not your, your typical IT guy, I guess. He really goes above and beyond. He actually volunteered with us doing field work, which is where this photo is from. So um, he's actually gone out and helped us collect data so that he could better understand um, our needs and our mission. So he's really, uh, we just love him so much. So <laughs> this is how we know that our data is safe and in good hands at least on that, you know, bit preservation level. Okay, you've made it this far. <laughs> We're gonna take another little break to let that sink in. So this photo is from another trek that I took last spring. Um, and this is in the Devil's River State Natural Area. This is a rock art site called Crab Shelter. Um, so this is in the, the Dan Hughes unit or the new Southern unit which wasn't open to the public um, yet. So it was really a treat to um, get kind of like a first look at the park when we were there back in April. Um, and it's just incredible. As you can see, um, the water is just an amazing color and there's some really interesting rock art there as well. I didn't get a picture of the rock art, I'm sorry, but um, I did get a picture of the beautiful landscape. So that was another real um, special thing that I've gotten to do with Shuma so far. Okay, so now that you understand a little bit more about where we are as an organization in this process, I'm going to briefly introduce some industry standards or best practices that have been established for digital preservation. So these standards kind of set some of the, the lofty goals for where we can and should be headed in the future. Um, I just realized I'm kind of running behind, so I'm gonna go a little faster now, I apologize. So the first standard we're going to cover is the OAIS reference model. And so OAIS stands for the Open Archival Information System. And this system is just uh, kind of another word for a digital repository or archive. Um, and this model was originally developed uh, actually for space agencies to manage their you know, huge stores of data but it's since become the international standard for digital preservation for all disciplines. So um, I want to note in this context, open refers to the process of developing the model. So it's open, uh, developed in like a public forum. So it doesn't mean you have to have open or freely available data to comply with the standard. So you can still have like a private or closed archive that fits this model. This is a very simple diagram of the model. So uh, the purpose of the model is to describe how a digital repository should function. And it defines common terminology that everybody can use when talking about digital preservation. So at its most basic level, it defines the function of the archive as managing the relationships between the um, producer of the digital object. So in our case, this would be someone like a Shuma archeologist. Um, the manager or curator of the digital objects. So it could be someone like myself. Um, it also kind of refers to the organization as a whole. Um, and the consumers of the digital objects, which are like the end users. So in our case, this may be researchers or educators, landowners, 
um, indigenous communities, or simply members of the general public that are interested in our images and data. So the archive is responsible for accepting digital objects from the producers, um, curating and managing those objects, and then providing access to them for users. So you'll notice that the archive here is kind of just, um, it's not a black box, but it's a blue box. And so the next slide, I'm gonna show you a much scarier diagram of what happens inside of that box. But I will walk you through the important parts. So um, like I said, it's a more complicated diagram. Um, again, I know there's a lot going on here. We could do an entire presentation about this standard, but the main thing I wanted to draw your attention to are the information packages, which are um, noted here as the AIP, or sorry, the SIP, AIP, and DIP. And we'll go through each one of these. And these information packages describe how digital objects are actually formatted and packaged at different stages of their life cycle as they kind of move through the archive from producer to consumer. So the SIP stands for the Submission Information Package. You can see it's located outside of the archive here by the producer. So these are the original digital files that were created by the data producer um, and selected and submitted to the archive um, for long-term preservation. So that's why it's called the Submission Information Package. After the records are submitted, they are transformed into an archival information package or an AIP. Um, and uh, these are the SIP files that have actually had those digital preservation actions performed on them, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. So um, we're saving these files that are in the AIP, the archival information package, in a format that is optimized for digital preservation. And so you'll see that these files just kind of live inside of the box that is our archive. And finally, the DIP stands for the distribution information package. So these are the files that the archive would share with a user or consumer upon request. So you can see that it's, it's kind of leaving the archive and going towards the consumer. Um, so an example of this, um, so they can be a different format than how you saved the file for preservation. So a good example of that would be um, like for our data, we would save the uh, or preserve the original high quality full resolution photo. But for distribution or use, someone may um, just want or need like a lower quality JPEG or even a cropped photo might be preferred. So that distribution information package might look different than the archival information package. So for our purposes here, um, the AIP is probably the most important thing we wanna consider for the future. And this ingest process here is where the archival information package is actually created. So this is where an archive would implement um, those digital preservation actions that we walked through earlier. So this is where you would migrate the file format. If you needed to, you would attach all of uh, the fixity data, such as the checksum. You would include all of the other required metadata, and then you would bundle this all together with the digital object in an archival package, which is similar to a zip file. So there are technical specifications for how this can be done to ensure that the files um, can be properly stored and read. Um, so this, in, in terms of shameless operations, this ingest process is the major process that we're not currently doing, but we wanna have our files packaged and stored this way in the future. So um, I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit, but um, uh, you can also have digital repositories that are certified as meeting the OIS reference model. Um, one of the major ones is in the UK, and there's another one based at uh, Arizona State University called TDAR. Um, so these are um, really great models for us because they specialize in archaeological data. Um, another standard that we look to is something called the FAIR principles uh, for scientific data management and stewardship. And so these principles advocate for making scientific data more findable or discoverable 
more accessible, interoperable, which means compatible across different systems and reusable. So currently our data does not um, meet these fair standards. So this is something we're looking really closely at when developing our digital preservation program. Um, and uh, it's something that's a little tricky to apply to archeological data because of those um, kind of access restrictions we talked about earlier and special conditions. But um, like I said, TDAR is a really great example. They have some really creative ways to meet the fair standards while still honoring those um, special conditions for archeological data. And finally, we have um, the care principles for indigenous data governance. So these principles were published as a complement to the FAIR principles. So these principles affirm that indigenous peoples are the owners of their cultural property and traditional knowledge, and that um, they should be actively involved in the stewardship and curation of indigenous data. So our data is considered to be indigenous data um, because the rock art uh, was created by indigenous people and it's a direct expression of their knowledge and worldview. Um, so the care principles are, are pretty in depth. So I, I encourage all of you to explore them in full. But the basic step for implementing this standard is to involve indigenous people in our data curation process and in our digital preservation planning with the goal of creating benefits for their communities. So this is something we'll be working on as well. Um, so this is, sorry, my slide is being a little sluggish. So this is kind of where we're at today, <laughs> if you will. So we're kind of here at the bottom of the cliff, if you will, um, looking up at these standards for digital preservation and kind of assessing our best way forward to achieve those standards. And there's a lot of options and considerations um, that we don't really have time to cover right now. I'm sorry I'm running so behind. But um, some of the important things we're looking at are whether we want to become a digital repository or whether we want to partner with an existing digital repository that's already doing digital preservation. So um, we might be able to partner with other organizations for some of those digital preservation actions. Um, but whatever option we go with, we will have to do a lot of data preparation because we're really the best people as the data producer to make sure that all of that metadata is attached to our images and to our files and that, you know, the full context is preserved. So something like the Alexandria project, we want to make sure that all of our digital objects associated with that project, um, that future users can understand the full context of how that data was collected and why. Um, so all of these options are gonna require um, a lot of resources going forward. And so um, we're kind of assessing what's needed going forward. Um, I'm hesitant to give a cost estimate because there's just too many variables at this stage that need to be defined. But just to give you an idea of the scale of digital preservation for our organization, um, in terms of lifetime costs, we are likely in the six figures here, potentially even into the seven figures. Um, however, we don't have to do everything at once. Like I said, that was more of a lifetime cost. And we're looking at ways to phase out the implementation of whatever uh, you know, kind of path we choose to go and the funding needs associated with those different phases. So financial sustainability is a big aspect of digital preservation planning. It's actually a big aspect of um, having your digital repository certified um, because it's really important for the organization to be able to support and sustain the digital preservation program over the long term. So that's something we're assessing for ourselves. So I wanna circle back to the title of my presentation, which frames this as a process of capacity building. So even though we have a long way to climb, we are used to getting into difficult places and accomplishing big goals. And we're just gonna tackle it one step at a time. Like I said, more of a phased implementation. So um, just to give you a preview, some of the things we'll be working on in the coming months 
is we have a lot of, um, the first thing is we have a lot of discussion and planning to do internally now that we've kind of gathered all of this information about what needs to be done. Um, we need to research potential partnerships and software solutions to help us accomplish all of these goals. Um, again, a big piece of the puzzle will be, um, you know, making sure we have all the resources needed to sustain the program. Um, we will be looking into grants that might be suitable for a project of our scale. Um, we will continue to learn about digital preservation from others in the field and strengthen our connections to that professional community. And we will also be continuing to invest in our relationships with indigenous communities. So these are the things we're all targeting um, in our plans going forward. And then finally, I just want to end by reflecting again on the tremendous value of these murals and their vulnerabilities. So you can see here an incredible rock art site that has been impacted by flooding. So our digital documentation of these rock art sites may be the only record of this library for future generations. So we really appreciate you joining us in our mission to preserve these amazing resources. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelsey. It's so much to talk about and, and <laughs> such a deep, um, a deep topic uh, that we we don't talk about enough because it it does uh, it is so so uh, detailed. Um, we do have a few questions. I know we're right at the one o'clock time frame, so people might have to jump off. And thank you so much for coming. We're going to stay on just a few more minutes, Kelsey, or, if that's okay with you, and yeah. answer just a few questions, maybe um, in another 10 minutes or so. We'll keep recording so that um, if you have to jump off, you won't miss the question and answer. Um, let me uh, go back to the chat and start with this one. How do you think about future proofing niche technologies like gigapan mm. yeah it's something we already i've already noticed a slight vulnerability because the software that we use currently to stitch gigapans there's a lot of different options it um, only operates on windows 10 it doesn't work on windows 11 so um, we're already upgrading some of our computers to windows 11 so we actually have to go to a specific computer to make our gigapants. So we have to adapt to that. Um, you know, I, I think we already have some ideas sketched out of programs we can switch to. It's just, we have a system working right now, so we're continuing to use it. But that's really, um, I think that question is excellent because it goes really at the heart of what digital preservation is, is you're always trying to think about potential things that can change because most of these changes are completely outside of our control. So, you know, we, all of us, most organizations have to rely on software that is produced by private companies. So they can change their software at any time. In the case of our Gigapan software, the company actually went out of business and it's just a software we really like. There's other options we can switch to, but um, so you really are at the whim of technology companies in a lot of ways. So um, you always kind of want to be thinking three steps ahead and have those other options line up. Now there is a possibility that maybe um, Kika Pants as a whole may not be supported. You know, we have to think about 10, 20, 50 years in the future. So that would be something that we'll have to think about at that time of whether there's a new format we could migrate into or whether it's something that um, we could preserve more in that uh, line with emulation where people could still access the gigapans as they were originally created, but maybe they would have to use a special computer or older software that's preserved in that, you know, maybe 2024, you know, environment. Um, but uh, I was gonna say something else about that. The other thing too, we're looking at with our gigapans and our 3D models, is they're created from photographs, usually hundreds or thousands of individual overlapping photographs that we take of the rock art panel. So something that is important is us preserving the original photographs so that we could always make a new 3D model or a new gigapan or maybe even something else that hasn't been invented yet from mm -hmm. those original photographs. 
So there's a lot of different strategies. Yep, perfect. Yeah. Another question, is the record of file modifications similar to blockchain technology? I don't know that much about blockchain, so I'm not sure. I, I can't speak to you on a technical level, like how they're related. I'm, I'm sure I would say it wrong. But <laughs> I mean, my I think it's related in my mind in the sense that there are digital tools to help you authenticate digital files. So the one, the technologies I gave um, were are the ones most commonly used in digital preservation. But certainly that's a much bigger issue that's addressed in lots of different industries and lots of different ways. Um, and I think blockchain is one of those examples. I don't know if we need like fully that level of, you know, we're not protect, protecting, uh, and my understanding of blockchain is used a lot for like Bitcoin and uh, digital currencies. And we maybe uh, don't need quite that same um, level for our needs. But. Awesome. Um, we have another question. This is a, a good long one. Uh, you have data mirroring, which is great for current data. Do you have a redundant system in place that has non-changeable data stored on the original software for archive purposes? I think I can answer that one and the answer yeah. is yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. We have um we have a redundant system, we have multiple um copies, but then we have the data mirroring. We ha Mario has us so yeah. so backed up and redundant um because think, as Kelsey said, this is this is our mission. So, yeah, yeah, I think what you might be getting at is like cold storage. So um Mario does uh, a lot of our backups are, are cold backups, so they're not mm -hmm. hooked up to a system. So they are, maybe that's what you're thinking of with like the archival storage where they're not, um, they're not being accessed. They're just totally separated. So if something happens to our network or to our active working files, it won't affect those cold storage backups and we can restore from those. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yes, that's a good point. That might be where she was getting with that one. Um, oh, well, most of the rest of these are just well done. You, Kelsey, great presentation. Um, Thanks for sticking with it. I know it's yes. longer than our <laughs> typical lunch and learn, but it was maybe a little ambitious to try and cover it in one presentation. <laughs> yeah. <but. laughs> maybe, maybe next year as we're, as we're continuing down this path, we'll break it into two yeah. um, and include even more rock art pictures and landscape yeah. pictures. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. We enjoyed it. Um, enjoyed having you and talking about this very, very important topic. Um, and we will see you at our next lunch and learn, which is oh, it's um, Mandy Newport talking about canyons to classrooms and our education initiatives. Um, so please join us for that. And if you would like to support the work that we're doing and and ensuring that this data is preserved, please um, please reach out um, and donate to Shuma. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.